Recording in progress, it says. So uh, I'm being recorded. That's very good. A uh, very strange American voice, but never mind. Uh, um, we're international here. You can have Zoom anywhere in the world. So as I say, my name's Henry Normal. Um, this is the New Poetry Society, and it's brought to you by the um, Manchester Libraries and Flapjack Press. So I'd like to thank them both, and uh, Paul Needs especially from the uh, Flapjack Press for setting this up. Uh, and thank you for joining us. Um, it's very nice to see you. Uh, we're going to have an hour of chat and um, poetry, of course, and uh, we're going to answer some of your questions. Now that'll be about halfway through. So um, I've got a special guest today. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm doing eight of these and I started last week and we had Jerry Potter. But this week we've got the fabulous uh, Genevieve L. Walsh. Uh, Genevieve, good to meet you. Uh, are you all right? Can I you... am all right. Okay. Now, I can now tell you because I'm no longer muted. Yes, I'm no longer... good. Fabulous to, to, to speak to you on, on Zoom. And, um, you know, uh, you and I met uh, at a poetry gig in uh, Manchester. Uh, now, oh, how many years ago now? Uh, that was in 2016 for the Lit Fest, I believe. Yeah, yes, uh, I was your support act. And um, the very first thing you ever said to me, you overheard me having a conversation about Affleck's Palace. Yeah. And uh, you turned to me and said, I used to be a goth for a bit, but I couldn't get the trousers right. Which <laughs> I think is the, the best thing that I've ever had as an opening sentence from anybody ever. Yeah, oh yeah, that's, that's, that's my famous chat. I've, I've got knobbly knees is my problem. You've got you've got to have you've got to have slender knees for to, to be a goth. You, you look uh, look strange. Oh no no, I, I've come to I've got knobbly knees myself. I've come to the conclusion that I'm going to look strange in anything, so it might as well be uh, fishnet tights, my friend. Yeah, good good, and uh, um, uh, a fabulous uh, uh, gig you did that night, and uh, I was very impressed. And um, uh, and you uh, became very soon after that a, a flapjack poet with your uh, your first uh, collection for flapjack, which was um, uh, a dance of a thousand losers. That's right. Yeah, um, at the at that point when I did that gig with you, we were still at the editing stage of the book. Uh, that was it was basically the first five years of my career all career um, all uh, all compiled into uh, into one collection I, I i did the terrible air quotes there due to the fact that for the first year of my performances it was largely open mics i think my entire income as a poet during that year was one bottle of rose and 15 quid um <laughs> well, uh, you know, uh, pe people do ask this. this. is one of the questions people ask. Uh, how, how do you actually make a living as, as a poet? So uh, going back to that, that point in time when you got your first book out, um, did you have like a, what you might call a proper job? Yes. Um, I, I Well, uh, a bit of front of house work at my local theatre. Uh, but at that point as well, I was also sort of running, running creative writing and performance workshops as well. Um, at the time, I was still with a group called the Firm of Poets, so that's largely how uh, I ran workshops at the time, yeah. Uh, and and that, during that, that time that, as well... Sorry, that was in Manchester, was it? Oh, with the Firm of Poets, it was all over the country. We did a, a huge, huge national tour in 2015, which uh, always included a workshop with some local poets. Yeah. At the time as well, I was also doing my uh, uh, degree in English literature. Uh, as well, so it was a it was a fine balancing act. Yeah, that way. Hey, that's, that sounds like you were pulled every which way. I mean, uh, Hitler only attacked on three fronts. You 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 you're out doing him, eh? Uh, <laughs> it's nice to know that I've outdone Hitler, Henry. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, you have to do that as a poet. You have to start off uh, uh, ambitious. Uh, I'd say. Um, so, uh, so that's brilliant, and um, it's interesting joining groups, isn't it? Because um, you you were you were you were born in uh, Halifax, is that right? I was born in London and moved to Yorkshire when I was uh, when I was about three years old. That's why I've got this all over the place accent. Well, um, it's it's not a London accent, I can tell you that. No, it's it's two accidents basically kicking the hell out of each other inside my mouth. So it's it's not a nice experience for anyone, especially me. Yeah, no, I, I think it's a lovely accent. Uh, you, you can call it uh, General North, can't you? 
Yes, I suppose so. Yeah. yeah Don, that, Doncaster uh, Station, maybe. Yeah, it's it's not quite as convincing as Kit Harrington doing his Jon Snow voice, but it's it's more convincing than most BBC attempts at a Northern accent, also. All right. Now, I'm just looking at the chat now. I should mention to people, we do have a chat facility down the side. And halfway through the event today, we'll be looking at the chat facility and taking questions for, for Genevieve. Uh, um, people are already chatting along, which is very good. Uh, hello from a very hot Nottingham. Uh, um, <laughs> somebody from Belgium. Uh, I from hot Cambridge. Uh, uh, so all all over the you, you, you've you've got um, uh, you've got fans far and wide. You've obviously <laughs> uh, obviously travelled. I think it's that accent that does it. It appeals. Oh, Cambridge sounds like a very 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 niche thing that somebody enjoys. Yeah, <laughs> it's, uh, Cambridge. <laughs> it's, it's, it could be a porno film. You never know, uh, Cambridge. <laughs> so, so, um, uh, so so growing up in uh, in Halifax, uh, how how did you? get into poetry I, I you know we're, I, I'm always fascinated because you get these poets from all over the country and um and I know how difficult it was in Nottingham uh, to mm. to um become a poet um not only just for myself to become a poet but then to actually say that I was a poet in in some way yeah um Halifax was a very different place to uh the place that it's become um so Writing and enjoying poetry was something you did kind of quietly uh, back when I was, especially when I was a teenager. Um, I think the obsession with poetry started because of my general obsession with Manchester, uh, which kind of started off with, um, you know, the um, the bands and uh, the photography that surrounded them. And so, you know, the the logical progression from liking a lot of those bands was to get into the poetry that inspired them, I suppose. But it's a very different place now. Um, there are, you know, we've, we've got our own uh, lit fest, you know, we uh, uh, there are poetry events far and wide. I believe you've got one in Halifax coming up in November. I, have, but I, I know they've been struggling over the over the, the pandemic, haven't they? Uh, Square Chapel, is it? Which is a brilliant yes, place. Yes. Uh, um, and uh, I hope they survive and I hope, I hope they thrive, even without me going there. I, I hope they do, because it's a it's a beautiful place to go. Uh, there's some lovely food uh, and it's got um, it's got different spaces. It's got a little space, hasn't it? Uh, um, which is great for, you know, people starting off. You know, it holds about, uh, I think, almost 100 people. And then it's got a big space for about 300 people, you know, for for, uh, for bigger uh, events. Um, so it's a perfect place. Uh, rooms for workshops and stuff like that. So mm. uh, um, yeah, no, it, it's uh, it's great that um, that places like Halifax are uh, you know are, are becoming more uh, friendly to creative arts because um, certainly when I started off, uh, uh, even a place as big as Nottingham seemed a little bit like a wilderness. Uh, mm. and so you felt very much on your own so so when you first started uh, did you know any other poets at all yes i did um i uh, i I, uh, I became sort of fascinated by a lot of poets on the uh, manchester scene who as it turned out were published by flapjack as it happened so that's why flapjack were one of the first uh, publishers that i approached um uh, jackie hagan for example was uh, a, a very big inspiration you know she really brought the stage alive um i think it was a combination of her and rosie garland probably that made me realize that you know it's poetry didn't have to be such a private thing it could be it could be something that you know really really captured people um yeah. and rosie, uh, rosie was in a band wasn't she indeed yes the march violets, march violets. Uh, so, so she got that crossover between uh um, and music and, and and poetry that you mentioned earlier. So, can, can you do as a poem uh, to start off with? Um... Yes. Um, okay. Um, so I will start with I think the title poem uh, from the book. So oh, this um, is from the new book, uh, Vitriol Works. Vitriol Works. Yes. Um, uh, yes, it was a long time in the making. This book. Um, so to give a little background to this this uh, this poem, which ended up being the title of the book is that since uh, 2003, I have taken the Halifax to Manchester train many a time in many an emotional and chemical state. And um, 
whenever I sat on the left hand side, I would see a sign just um, as as I was going through Middleton that said vitriol works. And I often thought, yes, yes, it does. <laughs> Dolls like you and me were anchored always in the past. Non-linear, nonsensical, perpetual title sequences run through our heads, no solace to be found in a single flame, no presence in our breath, no stillness in our core. No trinket box of glistening rocks, nor tea the shade of potpourri, or soft play incantation can bring us back to shore. Dolls like you and me need words that tear the stratosphere, need songs of mournful brokenness blared out through open windows, need rest in the arms of chaos, need rhapsodies and dirt. Softness used to serve us well, but right now, vitriol works. That's great. And, and you know, that that's a very good introduction to the book, isn't it, really? Uh, uh, yes, yes, I suppose it is, yeah. Um, uh, it, uh, I, I mentioned this in, in the introduction to the book, but my, uh, my previous book, uh, The Dance of a Thousand Losers, was split into two sections, so it was lost and found. Um, Vitriol Works was not split into two sections because the only state that everybody was in, especially post-Brexit, was angry and confused and more angry. <laughs> so, so these, these are poems written over the past two years, are they? Um, no, these uh, these were poems that were written during the uh, tour I did of, of uh, Dance with a Thousand Losers. So 2017 up, up to and including 2020, these poems were, um, yeah, and, and what a time that was. Oh, what, what an amazing time to be alive. <laughs> Now, um, what I like about your poems is they're very thought provoking uh, and you you um, you very much attack the subjects uh, and you're very uh, on the front foot um, wanting to change things and wanting to wanting to show us something that we, that we may have missed. Uh, is that a fair comment? I think so. Yeah. Um, I'm very wary of the fact that one day all people are going to have to look back at in, in at this point in time is statistics and figures and, and uh, you, you know sort of and when it comes to looking at a time that incorporates Brexit and Trump and um, uh, you know and ultimately Covid yeah. looking back at dry facts and statistics isn't really going to be enough to you know to bring home how much people have have, have suffered and, and stuff yeah, so yeah. I think it, the emotion that you can put in there with poetry is basically what you should use to let people in on how how this how this feels now I think I think I think you're right uh, um, it's like a, a non-fiction version of uh, current history uh, mm. um, and, and I think the the idea of, uh, of um, statistics don't really give emotion so to, to have the emotion in there and to to uh, let people understand how it feels to live through this time as opposed to um mm. you know the, the 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 well the awfulness of some of the statistics uh, and of course the, there's a lot of lies about it there a lot of misinformation so uh, mm. um so it was well but i, I did like uh, um i did like the your your use of language is very um, uh, very cutting at times, and uh, you know you're, um, you, you don't you don't use a soft word when a sharp word uh, will will uh, sort of do the job and, and get to the the juggler uh, as it were. Um, and it reminded me um, when I was in Manchester, I uh, um, I had to open a uh, an art gallery. I think mm. Burnley, and uh, I wanted to do a, like a little manifesto for, for art. So I wrote this poem. It's called uh, Malevolent to Inertia. To jar contentment, to aunt complacency, to baint resignation, to tease the tedious and the comfortable, to taunt the skeletons from the cupboard, to aggravate the thorn in the breast, to dip hands in cold blood, to tweak the upturned nose, to worry the apathetic, to trouble the indifferent, to vex the snug, to play devil to the dull, provoke and pester, nettling great, to unsettle, to stimulate, to deign against the grain, to disturb. So that was that was my little manifesto at the time. Um, That's very fitting because I, I, as far as I can see, it's not really art unless it in some way 
like you say, tweaks the nose at least, uh, uh, yeah. or you know, or the other extreme completely disturbs you. Uh, it's just wallpaper uh, unless it makes you see a sort of skew if um, a view of life. Um, your your son's art, I, I find uh, very thought provoking. I have to say. Thank um, you, thank you. This is it's, what, it's one of his uh, one one of his paintings oh, on the cup. Uh, oh, um, oh. <laughs> that's, as, that's as commercial as he's got, to be honest with you. Um, but uh, I, what I love about uh, what he does is um, uh, he's he's not influenced by anything else. He's doing his own thing. It's his view of the world, and uh, I get that from from your. Uh, uh, poems as well that you're um you have uh you know on both books i've got to say you have a style you have a, a way of looking at the world uh, and really um uh, a lot of the poems about your eye being caught by different things and often um uh, you know the um uh, the emperor's new clothes uh, uh you know you're you're sort of uh, pointing out um on there and uh, and I, I like that I, I like it when somebody sees something that i don't see and uh, so um uh, is this something when you first started is this something you were aware of that, that that's that that was the the way you were um you know sort of uh, creating yeah i think um noticing little little aspects of life that other people don't see. I, it, it's a shame when somebody notices something and it just ends up going completely under the radar or just ends up being the subject of a tweet when really you think that's an entire chapter of a book. Or, <laughs> um, so yeah, yeah, I'd, I, I'd agree with that, yeah. yeah. Um, now, I, I know, um, I, I know uh, um, you've got a, a little girl now. I have, yes. Yeah, uh, and uh, um, uh, what, what's her name? Her name is Richie Leia. I, um, in the dedication to Victory Old Works, do dedicate the book to her. Partially, well, partially because it's the done thing, isn't it? But partially because uh, a fair bit of the book was actually written when I was pregnant. Um, yeah. uh, being pregnant during uh, lockdown one was yeah. so much fun, as you can imagine. It's a time when you really need to reach out to people and yeah. you can't other than the two people who you have as immediate family. Um, and you don't, you don't really want to be going into hospital, do you, uh, during the lockdown? It wasn't great, no, especially the fact that a lot of the medical professionals I ended up seeing were dressed in full hazmat suits like Walter White in, uh, in Breaking Bad. It was, a, it was a strange experience, to say the least. So <laughs> a, fair, a fair bit of my being pregnant during COVID work is, is in there. Yeah. Um, it's, it's the stuff of, it's the stuff of uh, horror movies, really, isn't it? That, that you would have the protagonist would be having a baby at the worst possible time. You know, uh, during a, and as you say, uh, uh, scenes scenes of uh, of uh, your most personal times being there with these uh, people who are you know sort of masked up, and uh, I must be quite a strange imagery. It is, yeah, it is quite eerie as well. And and the only way to uh, the only way to sort of say it outside of of poetry, where you can properly sort of portray what it was like the only way you can say it is oh i was pregnant during lockdown one yeah. and that makes it sound like it was the the, the art and craft that i took up sort of like oh did you a way of getting through now i thought i'd grow a human <laughs> yeah. instead yeah so what you say? What what did what did you do in the lockdown oh i i, I grew a human uh, um <laughs> did, did you do anything useful <laughs> Oh yes, yes. Uh, I, I wouldn't recommend it. Please do take up quilting. <laughs> so, so do you think? Do you think being pregnant uh, um, affected uh, any of your poetry at all? That's a, a question I've never asked anybody before, but it, it struck me that um, uh, during this time it might. Well, yeah. It, I mean, um, a lot of my work already focused on, I'd, I'd say, um, isolation and uh, identity. Um, yeah. Being pregnant is a time when you somewhat lose your own identity and being pregnant during COVID, especially, uh, it, you know, it's just you with the four walls. So I think it did change or at least enhance my previous outlook. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting that you say about losing uh, your identity as opposed to changing your identity. Uh, um, mm. um, I mean, I mean they're, they're both uh, valid and both can happen at the same time, of course. Um, and as you say, uh, some of the poems are about um, uh, seeing what you're not, uh, no. uh, you know, and uh, and trying to define yourself in terms of, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, being against uh, something that you, you you don't want to become or you don't don't like. Um, it's a uh, it's a lifelong uh, journey that I think. Um, I asked people recently on. Uh, Facebook, I asked them what's the worst thing and the best thing about being old uh, or getting older. That's probably a nicer way of putting it. And um, a lovely answer came back. He said the, uh, the worst thing is becoming invisible. Mm. And the best thing is becoming invisible. <laughs> I love that. I love that because you do. And a lot of people wrote back and said, uh, I mean, a lot of people wrote back and said, um, uh, I, I, don't give, I don't give a monkeys now. Uh, you know, it, uh, in my youth, uh, I was so concerned about uh, how I was coming over and, and, you know, who I was and, and what I was and how people perceived me. Uh, and as you get uh, older, um, you're sort of liberated from that. Uh, yeah, I, I think age isn't the only uh, the only issue as well. I, I think um, a bit being forced into nine to five work, I think, often makes people lose who they are. Yes. And, and I can I can say this with uh, with the authority of someone who was raised by a teacher, um, because it, it, it some jobs do become part of you. And I think uh, expectations, uh, societal expectations, do play a part in it as well. Um, Particularly if you you happen to not be a man, um, I, I, I found. Although yeah, you know, I'm lucky to have found poetry in that respect because I no longer have to give a monkeys about being in any way subdued. I think, in <laughs> fact, if anything, if anything, people, if if I turned up without um, some kind of bringing the house down outfit on, people would say, "Is everything all right, Jen?" You, you, you appear to just be wearing a t-shirt and jeans. It's, it's everything all right at home. <laughs> it's, part, it's, part, it's part of the job that, that you're allowed. Mm. One, you're allowed to express yourself, which mm. uh, um, people can get sub, you know, uh, subjugated to. Uh, and two, you're, you're allowed to um, be extrovert. Now, uh, mm. what I found is most, most uh, poets, uh, most creatives are actually uh, introverts, but they become extrovert when they're doing their creativity and when they're doing their art um, and it, yeah. it is, it's a lovely excuse uh, it's one of the reasons why I call myself uh, uh, Henry Normal uh, um, I'm a very uh, uh, normal person but of course it allows you uh, and I was talking to Jerry yes, uh, last uh, week about this. It allows you to be braver and to be uh, so. Um, so I was I was quite quite interested in the way the way you always term yourself, Genevieve L. Walsh. Is mm. is, is 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 having the L in there? Is that part of this uh, stage identity that allows you to to be different? Um, yeah, I'd, I'd I'd say so actually, and. Um, uh, uh, <laughs> also, the accent on one of my E's doesn't actually appear on my birth certificate either. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I think the reason I, I've enjoyed doing that is that whenever people read a name like Genevieve, they've always got yeah. some kind of expectation. Um, there's someone I, I, I very much respect through the poetry scene called Steve Lyons, who yeah. messaged me after a gig that I did with you, funnily enough, saying, yeah. I looked at you and read your name and thought, oh, my God. And then saw you, and you were all right. I <laughs> <laughs> praise indeed. I praise. Yes. Con considered it for the back of the book, but people yeah. do often expect me to be a, a sort of champagne feminist, I suppose. Yeah. Um, well, it is a, it is an interesting name, Genevieve. Where does it come from, Genevieve? It was the first film that my mother ever saw oh. uh, in black and white, uh, projected onto the wall at primary school. I believe it was. Oh, yes, right. so yeah, first film she ever saw. I've watched it since. It's not great. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, you, you've got to go back in time. Uh, in I suppose it's lucky that the first film she saw wasn't Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. I yeah. don't think. Don't think that's no, it. If if my if my son had uh, have been uh, um, a girl, uh, um, I'd have called uh, uh, Amelia after ah. a song, song by Joni Mitchell. 
uh, oh. Amelia uh, Urquhart. Uh, um, and, uh, uh, you know, it, it, to me, it's a good song. Somebody else, it mm -hmm. might not be a, a great song. So, it, 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 you know, it's, it's all there. Now, um, I'm conscious that we need to do some poems because I want to hear some of yours and, and let everybody out there hear some of your poems. So uh, can you give me another one? Yes, yes, I can. Um, OK, well, since we've been talking about um, appearances, I suppose, um, let's have a look. Yeah. So um, this was actually a poem I originally uh, performed as part of a, uh, a show about alternative culture that I wrote um, called The Place in the Shade. And it's, uh, it, it's about, in a roundabout way, street harassment, but specifically of women of the alternative persuasion, yeah. um, largely because a lot of men assume that if you have interesting hair and tattoos, you are going to be a manic pixie dream girl, whereas really you're just a woman who is waiting for a bus and wants to be left alone. So this is called Join the Dots. There are no lessons to be learned. There'll be no big reveal. You'll not be carried off in plumes of cigarette smoke to some deep, profound conclusion. She's not here to advance the plot to help you grow and join the dots. She's not some paper sprite devoid of life and a third dimension. She is years of calluses and bleach spots. Weeks of tedious conversation, hours upon hours of listen, love and smile. It might never happen. She is minutes ticking by to the next thankless task. Her eyes don't say come hither, they say don't fucking ask. There are no lessons to be learned. You'll not hold her flailing tattooed hand on the long road to catharsis. She's not here to be saved or soothed or solved like some intricate puzzle. She came here to breathe, smoke and stare, free for th five rare minutes from the choke of the corporate muzzle. Time. Brilliant, brilliant. Uh, um, it's strange, isn't it, that uh, even in this day and age, we have to we have to state these things. We have to remind people, and we have to educate people. Uh, mm. um, but we do, we do. It's a, it's an ongoing education. Uh, I mean, my generation, um, you know, tried very much to make sure, sort of, in comedy, there was no uh, racism, no mm. uh, sexism. Uh, but still, um, you know, there, as, as the years go on, there's areas, regionalism, you know, people take the mickey out of people from the north or, you know, uh, Liverpool or Newcastle. Um, there's uh, uh, body shaming humour, isn't they? You know, where people make fun of fat people, tall people, short people. Um, ageism is a lot you know uh, and so it's an ever going process of of uh, trying to get people to um to understand the other person's perspective absolutely um i mean i found in a, a lot of the comedy that you wrote or, or worked on it, it was made very clear that people who who were racist or regionalist or sexist were basically portrayed as complete idiots and um, uh, unfortunately, it, it has become a situation where uh, it's happening for real. A lot of people are a real Alan Partridge now, unfortunately. Um, yeah, yeah, maybe, maybe online, um, uh, uh, living online has made it a little bit easier for people. So in a way, I think it's the job of people um, uh, who have some kind of uh, public platform to make it clear that you know it stops here basically yeah i i i was very much behind uh, the england football teams uh, mm. uh, taking the knee and uh, um just to keep the conversation uh, uh to the fore rather than you know let it drift and everything there's a sort of uh, thing and I, you pointed out in in your uh, book of poems about becoming too comfortable about, uh, you know, letting things uh, slide. And um, uh, I, I think that's always a danger. I, I think we, we, we have great advances and, uh, you know, um, individual people make great advances and, and then somehow uh, easy prejudices slide mm. in. Uh, um, and so it's a, it's a constant battle, unfortunately. It is, it absolutely is. And just because the World Cup's over, We've we've got to keep fighting for what taking the knee actually means. I mean, I 
uh, I have nothing but respect for Marcus Rashford. He's he's done more than any Manchester United player ever to annoy racists, and he didn't even have to leap up and kick one. You know, Canton Arm must be absolutely gutted. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> um, yeah, uh, it, it, yeah, it, it it has to stop here. It would be very easy for me as a white person to sit back and go. Oh well, it doesn't affect me. I'm just gonna sort of butt out and watch the Big Bang Theory and just crack on with my life. But no, we, you know, we we have to properly open our eyes to these things. I, I was uh, I was interested in your book. Uh, there was a um, a poem about uh, middle class dads, and oh, I had yes. to question whether or not I'm a middle class dad uh, um, because uh, obviously uh, I'm working class with money. I still eat beans on toast. Uh, um, uh, yeah, I've actually got here's a. I'll show you a little. But I've actually got a sofa in my dining room, uh, um, which I th I think is is something I would never have had years ago. It's just uh, I, I had a spare sofa, I had a space in my dining room, and I, I put it in. But it, it does strike me that if anybody come round here, they they think uh, I've been all bloody lardy da. Uh, um, so no, you just want to be comfy. That plus is that, that that's that's a completely classless issue. Wanting to be comfy, Henry. Is it? Oh, good, good. Because because I was a bit worried about it. Anyway, I, I wrote I wrote a poem uh, called "Sofa in the Dining Room." Uh, uh, as it as it, uh, uh, it it's it's me uh, just wanting to sort of uh, talk to myself about the subject. So this is it. Here we go. Sofa in the dining room. The irony of reading a book about beautiful trees doesn't escape me. I feel abused by the faint-hearted. I know I would die working class, fists clenched and one eye on the door. I know you can't fight the ocean and that greater men than me have died like kittens. I know I can't do fashionably distressed and looking back in the early morning snow, I see my father's footprints. I'd rather sleep in a chair than lie down in the afternoon. If the line breaks, it won't be me. That was fantastic, mate. That was brilliant. It's funny, isn't it? I, I, when I, I, I think about the fact that um, by now, I th you think I would be easy with things, but I still, and I, I picked this up from your book, I'm still wanting things to change. Mm. I'm still curious, but I'm still wanting to the world to... Um, not sort itself out, because I don't think it ever would do, but sort out the obvious. Uh, Absolutely. Because there's some things that are a bit obvious. Um, um, now, you've got, a, you've got a, a live event, haven't you, coming up? I have, yeah. Um, so I've been running uh, a night called Spoken Weird since 2013. Uh, we held our last event in the beginning of, uh, of well, our last 2020 event um, in March last year, and uh, we've restarted holding live events now. Um, Thursday next week uh, yeah. in Halifax, we'll be holding one with uh, Dave Viney, who's uh, another flatjack poet who's absolutely fab, uh, his personal favourite uh, of ours. And it's an outdoor gig at um, the Greyston Unity, which has featured on BBC Six a couple of times. Great. So it's Thursday. What time does it start? Uh, 7.30. I really should know these things. I organise well, it. Well, you, you, you don't want people to turn up halfway through. So 7.30. Oh, no, 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 uh, no. The name of the place is? The Greyston Unity. Greyston Unity. And it's next next Thursday. So uh, um, anybody in the Halifax area, I don't think the person from Belgium is going to be there. But, you know, uh, uh, some others uh, maybe. Um, uh, that's great. Shall we have a look at uh, uh, now? Uh, anybody uh, that's listening on the chat, if you want to ask uh, Genevieve uh, a question, here we go. It's got a, it, it, it's marked it. Uh, the person's marked it. Let's have a look who it is. Uh, question. So you can't mistake it. There we go. Uh, <laughs> this is uh, uh, Mirabel Swindler. Uh, she, uh, every, everyone. Right, okay. Uh, um, here we go. Question. Uh, they're seeing something and they're saying it. Do either of you think there might be more than its fair share of neurodivergent folks in the poetry world? Let me just forget this right. Do either of you think there might be more than its fair share of neuro neurodivergent folks? In oh, the so I, um, uh, are a lot of uh, poets neurodiverse, I think, yes. is what's being asked there. Yeah. The answer to that is yes, definitely. 
um, uh, I, I would say so. Um, so it's it's because of that that me and Anna Percy from Sturd started an event called the uh, uh, Invisible Disability Slam because um, the slam format was very very is very very daunting to a lot of people who are um, neurodiverse. So um, it, the, there was a big call for it. And yes, having a, 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 a an, an at least slanted view of life can lead to you sort of moving towards poetry rather than another medium so i'd say yes definitely definitely a large pro uh, proportion of us I, th I think it's almost a definition of, of poetry mm. that that, uh, that it's a neurodiverse um and uh certainly um i love uh the fact that other people are telling me things that I wouldn't think of because their brain works different to mine uh, and it makes my world bigger. Uh, and I love that. Now, you said a funny thing to me uh, um, before we uh, go on here. You, you said, uh, and I think you've put it in uh, on Twitter, um, that I'm the weirdest person you've ever met. You are, Henry. In, in what, <laughs> I'm in sure what you're way? the weirdest person that a lot of people have met. <laughs> it, I, I don't see it, you see. It's like, it's like your own accent. You don't see your own accent, do you? No, no, you do not know. Um, but yes, you definitely are. So in what way would I be weird? Well, like I said, the first thing you said to me was about not being able to fit into goth trousers. Whenever no. I meet someone, I, I always have uh, something ticking away in my brain saying, don't say anything weird, don't say anything weird. Right. And then you beat me to it. <laughs> right. 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 And well, your approach uh... to in your poems as well is, is it's weird in exactly the right way. Um, yeah, what, what I like to think is I like to think that we're all deep down uh, mm. quite quite similar I wouldn't say the same but quite similar and so w when you write a poem and, uh, and I, I'd say this in in uh, of your poems um, you're writing it for yourself and there's a conversation you're having with yourself but when other people read it they tune into that bit of their themselves uh, and and they connect and uh, and I think you can't do that unless we've all got some sort of commonality uh, and so uh, so I love that so I I, I like to uh, I like to think I'm as daft as everyone else uh, um, in, in the way now good question uh, and uh, and flapjack is currently open to submissions oh yeah here we go in an advert for flapjack currently open to submissions for neuro, neuro, neuro diverse writers uh, due next year Oh, that's it. So anybody out there, do uh, do good. I've got to say, uh, um, I love uh, Flapjack uh, Press. Yeah. I, I love the, the 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 old ethos behind it. And uh, if you have if you have a look at all their uh, writers, um, there's a great energy to it all. It's it's not just um, you know farming out uh, uh, sort of. Uh, things that you know table mats it's actual ideas for you to get into uh, so uh, so lovely doing uh, doing this um so uh, you've not been able to do any uh, gigs this past year well no a lot of people haven't uh, I've, I've done a fair few of these uh, these zoom gigs yeah. and uh, in a way i was very very grateful of that due to the fact that when you're pregnant a, a sat down gig is absolutely ideal <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, for for yeah, for a little while, uh, um, I I did have a sort of gig corner in the uh, conservatory at my uh, partner's house, yeah. um, where I was occasionally joined by the world's biggest fluffiest cat. Um, I, I, you know, I, we, when we held the spoken word event last month, uh, which again was an outdoor event, um, I think everyone that approached the mic, including Jonathan Kinsman, who was headlining, just said. Oh, this standing up's weird, isn't it? <laughs> Everybody's, <laughs> yeah. Everybody's got so used to sitting down in their own house doing a gig. Um, it's quite, a, yeah. quite nice and personal as well. I think there's something, you know, uh, um, personal about it. Uh, um, but I will, I will be loving. I'm touring from October, and I, I will love the idea of, you know. There's something about being in the same room and sharing the moment uh, and uh, hearing the laughter that um, that I'm looking forward to. So now, uh, um, uh, um, another poem that would be great. Okay, uh, right, yeah. So yes, this is one that I I wrote last year. Um, uh, this is one of the uh, one of the ones I wrote during uh, pregnant lockdown fun times. Um, so. 
the NHS website are very, very keen on uh, telling you what size your baby is uh, in relation to a fruit. And um, <laughs> yes, one of the things that I learn is that um, I only know what about three fruits look like. Um, <laughs> It was it was especially hard as I couldn't even go to a supermarket to go and look at how big a papaya is. Yeah, um, yeah so uh, yes, this is called oranges are one of the three fruits. Yeah. She's built in unknown quantities, a slice of life in measurements unused for centuries, a Martian week, a Plutonian night, three quarters of a Mississippi, seven hands, two pyramids, a ship that made the Kessel run in 12 parsecs. In essence, she is massive, but she's tiny. So panic, but don't panic. Lose your mind, but don't lose your mind. Find your so-called happy place and scream at it. She's fruit that you've only seen on posh cider bottles, through Canal Street goggles, just glossy, polished nourishment for deities untouchable, the stuff they squeeze, ferment, and sell as aperitifs you can't afford. So panic but don't. Lose your mind, but don't lose your mind. She is fresh fruit, but she may be bruised or chewed by worms or rotting. Stay alert, but not too alert. Sleep well, but not too well. Be calm, be still, be petrified. A placid orchard wrapped in flame. She is the size of terror, the size of grief, the size of lust, the size of a cartoonish smile drawn in your breath on a window pane. So panic, but don't panic. Sing morbid songs in your daftest voice. Find your so-called happy place and ruin it with ugly colours. She's the size of your contentment in those cider-drenched Canal Street summers. The size of your crooked wingspan, your battered leather roots, your million grim lyrics and your list of just three fruits. That is brilliant. What a lovely... Uh, and and uh, when she grows up and reads that, uh, uh, you know, in the book that's dedicated to her. What a, what a lovely um, gift. That is. <laughs> I'm not sure how she'll like the uh, the images of her possibly rotting, but yeah, thanks. I'm, no, I'm but, sure yeah, but hey, it's all part of uh, it's all part of life. Uh, um, and uh, there 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 is a weird thing with fr uh, fruit in there or vegetables um, <laughs> that you know they're, they're, nowadays they're they're um, they're almost. Uh, super hygienic and super you know they, they, they don't like any knobbly bits do they uh, no, uh, it's, almost, it's almost like a it's like some sort of fascist uh, um quality control that they've got to get through i i like a bit of uh, um you know sort of uh, muck and uh, and uh, you know sort of imperfection in, in my for and anime people i like i like imperfection in people as well not that i've ever met a perfect person but there you go um, it, it, it's difficult with sizes of fruit, though, isn't it? Because uh, tomatoes are a fruit. Oh, and yeah. Cherry tomatoes and beef tomatoes. And they're very, yeah. very different, very different. You see, I, I've always been confused by that question they ask politicians about how much does a, a loaf of bread cost? Because yeah. <laughs> you, you, there's a type of bread you could you could scrape together enough pennies from behind the couch for, or yeah. you could get the expensive sourdough that you have to remortgage your house for. I, yeah. I've, I've always found that a weird question. Yeah, and, and do we really expect, um, you know, sort of uh, the people that's running the country to go and buy their own bread? Uh, um, or do we expect, uh, you know, uh, them to, I don't know, eat in cafes? It'd be fun if they did. I'd love to see Pretty Patel in Greg's. Yeah. <laughs> That that's a that's a great poem. <laughs> Pretty much telling Greg's. Yeah. Uh, that's funny. That's made me laugh. I'm sorry if you feel I've bought too many sausage rolls. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, um, during the uh, lockdown, because uh, uh, my lad's uh, autistic, and uh, um, uh, we've got uh, a lot of people around us that are. are um, uh, sort of uh, shielding um, we've not really seen anybody uh, the, the only people I've seen is on Zoom so we've kept uh, for a year and a half we've kept ourselves to ourselves and the only little trip we do we've not been into town or anything like that um, is we go because I live in Brighton we go along the coast mm. uh, and so so my sort of uh, sort of what you might call landscape for uh, uh, for 
inspiration has been along along the coast. So I've got a poem here called Cookmere Avon, which is just down from from Brighton, uh, and it's interesting that as as I look at my garden and as I look at the coast, um, it's really an internal landscape that I'm looking at. So even though I'm representing it with things that are outside me, the, re the, the reason I choose those things is because of, uh, of what's inside me. So um, this is called Cookmere Avon. Sun stripes the seven sisters like a barcode. The sea and the sky are sketched with the same pen. Dandelions and buttercups lie scattered like coins loose on your dresser. A lighthouse serves little purpose during the day other than to wait, though I know somewhere on this misnamed earth, there are always ships out at sea, still in the dark. Again, that was really fantastic. And I, I, I really enjoyed your coastline updates uh, over the <laughs> last year. No, 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 they've been, no, I'm not being sarcastic, they've been great. <laughs> No, well, I, I, I do, uh, you know, you, you can only work with what you got. Uh, and it's, uh, it's funny how your vocabulary uh, um, mirrors your surroundings. You know, there, uh, there's a lot of, uh, in my poems, there's a lot of uh, um, words to do with sky and sea and that, because that, that's, that's what I see of, uh, uh, every day. Um, but that's one of the things I like about looking at other worlds. So I read your book and I see a landscape that surrounds you. Mm. And, uh, and I think one of the great things about books is, is it can give us a different landscape and a different perspective. Yeah, I think so. I mean, even just within the stable of uh, Flapjack, a lot of us grew up in uh, different places, but we're teenagers in different places. So all of us have at least a different landscape within our heads that we're working with, I think. Um, mm. You know, it even... Uh, Poets that have grown up in different parts of Manchester will have a, a different sort of um, lexicon that they use, I think. Yeah, yeah. Because I, I don't really want to be the kind of poet that writes about places they've just imagined. I, oh, I God, think... no. Oh, God, no, no, no. I, 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 there's something authentic about it sifting through you, mm. but it being, you know, it's coming from a real place and it's sifting through you and then, then it, it becomes a different form of real. Uh, I like to think it becomes uh, um, a greater truth uh, um, than, than, you know, than, than just the objective uh, that you're looking at. Um, so Manchester, uh, and what drew you to Manchester? Oh, the, the same thing that draws everybody to Manchester. It's a, a cultural centre of the country. It's um, the, the music is just fantastic. Every... Every single bit, I can walk through Manchester and see the most terrible bit of it and think, ah, I'm home. <laughs> you know, a smashing bottle and a big puff of marijuana smoke and it's just like, ah, I've missed you. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I think um, maybe in a strange way, I think one of the things that um, possibly romanticised uh, Manchester for me was 24-hour uh, party people. Yes. Um, uh, well, the first time I saw that, I was absolutely drawn to the place. And strangely, as I got older, bits of that film became sort of part of my life. A lot of it was filmed in Jilly's Rock World, which is yeah. where I ended up spending my every weekend for the best part of two years. And uh, uh, it features an awful lot in my first book as well. Uh, uh, you know, the, the, the place where... Uh, the funeral scene was filmed for Ian Curtis, was around the corner from where I lived in Salford, all of the above, so that, that sort of grew with me. It, it was, um, I've got to say, it was an interesting time. I, so I was there, um, uh, I mean, I've worked uh, Manchester ever since, but I was there uh, very much in the 80s and 90s, and um, uh, it was uh, an adventure a real adventure and people like Lem uh, I met when he was 19 and uh, Steve Coogan when he was 19 so uh, th they were at the stage where they were trying to do something but we didn't know where we were going and, mm. and that's quite exciting because you don't know that they're going to be successful you know uh, um, so you do a gig you know in Aberdeen uh, uh, you know and get 30 quid and for going all the way up there you know and you drive up together 
and and do the gig and you'd only know you you know the other people in the car and then you drive back down again and it gave such a great sense of community and so uh, a lot of the um creatives in manchester at the time had a great sense of community and i think that um that helped everybody uh, and then you know um when i had a tv show i got uh, uh, steve and uh, all, all my mates from the north onto that show and then when they had uh, um shows they got all all the mates onto, onto those shows and uh, and so the community arts aspect of it uh continues to this day which is great uh, it's one of the reasons why you and i are, are talking that we form a sense of community which is which is brilliant yeah i think the uh, the the poetry scene in manchester does have that element to it actually uh just sort of like i'll get up and see whether this works type thing and you know, people getting to know each other as a proper community. Um, uh, Manchester Fringe is, is is great for that as well. You get to see people's um, proper raw work in progress stuff. Yeah. Um, I, I know at least at least um, five people who've said, brilliant, I've got uh, a show on at the Manchester Fringe. Suppose I better write it now. When you say the Manchester <laughs> Fringe, is that, is that the uh, literature fringe or the fringe of the main uh, arts festival? It's uh, the Greater Manchester Fringe, the one that incorporates sort of poetry and comedy and theatre. So it's a, and yeah. the thing is, the lines in Manchester I've found are often blurred between those uh, are, particular yeah. genres as well. Yeah, uh, I mean, even people like Joy Franz, who I know manages to, uh, you know, incorporate things like battle rap into that as well. You know, yeah. um, it's a, it's a great, a great place for yeah. blurring the lines uh, what, between what, those genres, and that needs to happen. Great. Well, it, that, that was always the case in that uh, there weren't really any poetry uh, events for you to be on when I, when I was there. So you had to be on uh, jazz clubs, folk clubs, uh, um, any any former club uh, you'd, you'd you'd be on at, and uh, a lot of the uh, sort of uh, different disciplines all gig together. Uh, so I, I used to go on in front of bands. I, I once did a battle of the bands over towards Halifax. Uh, and that was weird because there was, uh, I think there was eight bands and uh, uh, as with Battle of the Bands, they all hated the other bands because they wanted their band to win. And the only thing they had in common was that they all hated me. <laughs> that sounds familiar. Because <laughs> <laughs> I was I was comparing it, but uh, you know, hey, I got through, so uh, that's all right. Um, now we're going to uh, um, uh, take any last questions. If uh, anybody's got a question, we'll take a last question, and then we'll do uh, um, uh, a poem. Um, so uh, um, thanks for for being on. It's been been great uh, to uh, to talk to you. Um, what do you think this next year holds uh, for yourself, apart from obviously uh, um, being a mother? Uh, well, uh, I, I'm going to take the book to as many uh, parts of the country as I can. Um, I, I've got to know people up and down the country from when I taught the first book. And uh, yeah, there are little places that I, I'm, I'm dying to get back to and larger places as well. Um, oh, particularly Basildon. I did a, I did a gig in one <laughs> Particularly I, Basildon. I, yeah, I, 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 did a, I did a gig around the corner from where Depeche Mode did their first gig. And that, that was magical um, uh, so yeah touring the book I'm also working a lot with a uh, group called Stand Up Sisters over in Bolton uh, working as a, uh, a, a workshop leader and a mentor so that's proving very exciting I'm also finishing my master's in creative writing which Ooh. is um, that's an experience yeah. I've got to say yeah um, well, you got, got, a, got a, a lot on there that, that well, it's good uh, well i'm i'm hoping because uh, it, it's weird isn't it people have said um you know where uh, that thing that you thought I'll, I'll do when i've got nothing else to do when, when i've got no interruptions if you haven't <laughs> done that during covid you're never going to do it are you no no absolutely not no <laughs> uh, and uh, um, I, i've written a couple of books uh, and um got myself a uh, 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 a few things sorted uh, which I, i'm just um, uh, looking at a, a new book of paintings for my son at the moment so we've got about a thousand i'm, I'm not exaggerating here. we've got about a thousand paintings of his uh, in the garage upstairs all, all around every, everywhere um and so uh, we photographed them all and I, i'm trying to uh, i'm trying to pick 100 to go in a book uh, um and it's very very difficult um now this is your book now uh, vitriol works 
Genevieve L. Walsh. So people can get this by going to Flapjack Press, just type Flapjack Press and, uh, and Genevieve uh, Walsh in the Google and you'll get it. But you're, you're also <laughs> the, Googles. On, the Google, the Google, that, that's how many old people can say that, the Google. Now, um, uh, you're also on Twitter. I am, yes. I'm at Jen Walsh Poet on both Twitter and Facebook, yeah. Uh, and what about Instagram? Instagram? Yeah. Too old for Instagram, Henry. You're too old, but I'm, I'm definitely too old. But my, my wife does it for me because she's younger. So uh, she sorts that out. I just I just give her a photo and say, stick that on. Uh, um, uh, but I, I love doing the, the uh, Facebook and, uh, uh, and and the Twitter. Uh, um, I... Um, <laughs> It, I, do you know it's very personal? It's quite nice. I hope uh, people uh, join in and uh, you know and follow us and and uh, get some of the books and that. Um, it, it sort of cuts through uh, a lot of the uh, us and themness. Uh, I think uh, of these things because you can you can talk to Stephen Fry one minute and you can talk to uh, you know your neighbour next door another minute and talk to somebody in Australia the next minute. It's very um, very much uh, uh, an equal system, I think, which is which is nice. Uh, somebody's asked me if I'm going to Nottingham. Yes, I, I'm going to be gigging in Nottingham uh, on the 16th of November at the Metronome. Uh, so I, I think we've sold off the tickets, but um, if we don't have to social distance, uh, there should be some left. Um, uh, if we sold off and there's off, you'll have a space either side of you, won't you? So, uh, uh, Genevieve, can you f give us a last poem? That would be lovely. And yeah, then... since you've done one of your by the sea poems, I think I'm yeah. going to do the only uh, one of the only sea related poems I've I've ever done. Um, this I wrote when um, uh, back in 2016, when the death of Prince and Brexit were the two things that everybody was talking about. Um, we went to Blackpool and completely by accident parked next to somewhere that sounded like a, a Brexit Britain Prince song. Yeah. So this is called Great Hotel, spelled G-R-8 Hotel. Baby, if you like to say great with a sarcastic inflection and your expectations aren't as high as they used to be, I'll take you to a great hotel and show you a really, really adequate time. You'll remember it as slightly less shit than the daily grind. It'll briefly pique your interest. You'll be up and dressed in time for the last bus home. It's going to be so great, honey, a whole 10 minutes with your mind off the money spent on bonds and fripperies while the scenery gives way. There'll be no champagne, no lobster, no last minute tryst to Paris, no Venetian escapades, just this bad cover version of greatness. Ta. That is brilliant. Well done. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, that, that would be the worst chat of London, wouldn't it? Wouldn't it? <clears throat> Come and have an average time. <laughs> that would be the uh, probably the uh, one of the truest uh, um, chat of lines, but, but one of the worst. <laughs> Uh, uh, so uh, great, to, great to speak to you. Um, uh, thanks again to uh, Flapjack Press and to Paul Needs uh, uh, for uh, sorting this out for us. Uh, thanks to uh, the libraries, uh, Manchester libraries, for for sorting it out. Um, and uh, do support your Manchester libraries and all the libraries, uh, even the libraries in Belgium, uh, and that would be great. Um, I'm going to finish with a poem called Staring Directly at the Eclipse. I should mention that next week, I've got um, a poet called Thick Richard. Um, who, uh, um, you know Thick Richard, Genevieve, don't you? Oh, I know him and his fantastic sweary face very well. <laughs> well, uh, he should be on. I'm, I'm not sure I'll be able to control him, but uh, uh, it'll be interesting. Um, so, uh, so do join us uh, next week. So this is uh, called Staring Directly at the Eclipse. This was uh, um, the first book I wrote uh, after coming back to poetry. And uh, I wanted to write a poem about um, the things that I live for. Uh, when I was in Manchester and I, I was a bit um, upset at uh, some point and my career wasn't a great career, wasn't going anywhere and uh, I sat in the bath I remember and I remember thinking uh, in my 20s I remember thinking what's the point of me getting out of this bath and and, and then I started to wrinkle up a bit <laughs> so I thought well I, I best get out and think it think it through once I'm out uh, but I couldn't think of a reason 
And so I thought uh, now, uh, as I'm a little bit older, I would uh, I'll write down the reasons I, I get out of the bath. It's called Staring Directly at the Eclipse. It's written to my wife. Your feet on my lap as we settle for the night, a shoreline to ourselves, sunlight on water, nature catching the eye unexpected, fresh air intoxicating, getting lost in art and endeavour, music that carries and caresses, food presented as a gift, being surprised by genius or kindness, your face flush and immediate, a friendly soul at my window, hope in all forms, however tiny, the comforting modernity of doing nothing much, the absence of pain and fear, however fleeting, a familiar arm around my shoulder, the satisfaction of something done well, loyalty and honour embraced, minor revelations of perception, the defiance within spirit against overwhelming odds, valour and grace in the face of the inevitable, to spite death and make his victory honour. Oh, that was a fabulous one to close with, Henry. Cheers. See you all next week. Thank you.